So, well, hello there. Yeah, you can switch to the next one. And welcome to um, uh, the Innovation Theatre Killed My Company. Um, Sora Nielsen um, is going to talk about um, uh, what happened with Earn It, with his startup, and which was actually a great idea and everything. Um, so what we can do in the meantime, while I'm going through the intro, it's always nice to know um, who is in the call. And um, maybe that is also a great uh, opportunity for you to network with each other. So if you feel like it, and you don't have to if you don't want to, but if you feel like it, um, do use the comment section to just quickly write your name and maybe um, function or company you're working at, if you're also willing to network with other people. So um, thank you. We'll move on one slide, please. Sabrina? Great. So my name is Angela Lutcher. I'm a head marketing innovation and digital and also I'm the newest board member at WeShape Tech. Um, so if you during the presentation somehow feel you want to share your thoughts um, and you want to do so, um, for example, on Twitter, um, we love if you tag us um, with the at WeShape Tech. Sabrina? Great, so just quickly, because I'm the newest member and you, you probably don't know anything about me yet. Um, I ended up at We Shape Tech because basically I'm a tech lover and being a woman, I've had my experiences, um, including um, having to explain that even though I, I do um, have the ability to bear children that um, my bosses can still promote me and so on in like my early years. Um, and I'm half Italian and half Swiss, um, so it was always, you know, one part saying, oh, you're Swiss, and the other part saying, oh, you're Italian, and me in the middle and always thinking, what the heck, uh, it's so not important, you're a good person, you're a bad person, that's what's important, so it was kind of natural, and it was actually Sabrina who um, kind of hooked me up with We Shape Tech, She's the second newest member of um, of the board. Um, so in my real life, I also do, I'm, I'm a marketeer, um, uh, besides uh, having worked uh, for a long time in the financial sector, um, I've worked in the innovation sector and um, I also do some marketing um, and branding uh, consulting for uh, Indonesian resorts. Um, uh, I love to travel. Um, I'm a photographer, both on land and on the water, which brings me to telling you that I'm a diver. And I'm a citizen scientist. If, if you don't know about that, uh, look it up. And there's some great sites you can uh, kind of donate some of your time to help scientists with identifying animals and transcribing things and so on. Um, so uh, I think we can move on, Sabrina. So we shape tech. Um, those of you who know us already, um, they know you know that um, we're basically a global platform, um, which a great, great, great community, and we stand in for greater diversity and inclusion in technology and innovation. That is our mission, and um, it's a movement that has grown uh, since it was started in 2016. And um, I think. Uh, we can be proud of like all the networking and how much uh, we're helping each other in the community. Sabrina? So by now we have uh, actually more than 60 role models. Um, we're six board members. We have had um, over 64 events. And um, you can see that we have uh, almost uh, uh, 1,800 uh, subscribers and a total um, community of um, additional six. 1,853 um, followers on social media. Um, so if you share something with our community, your reach is quite nice. And it's nice to know how many people you might be helping with your input, like Søren is doing today. Um, so yes, Sabrina. So um, if you sign up to our newsletter, um, you will, of course, always keep in touch with um, with our new role models or voicing ambassadors with all the knowledge we're sharing or people in our community are sharing any news any events that are um, actually being set up and uh, keep your eye out. We have some new ones coming also. 
and of course some tips, tricks, and hacks like podcasts and and books and uh, and things like that. Thank you, Sabrina. Do also check back on our blog where we have um, different sections, uh, be it role models or from events, opinions, where you can also find the voicing ambassadors, knowledge, news, and other inspirations. Sabrina. So um, if after Søren you haven't had enough yet, on um, uh, 8th of June, we have uh, Felix Steritz uh, talking about the decisive decades. Then we have a um, personal branding topic on 17th of June. And something I'm also personally excited about um, because it, it concerns also AI um, is on the 30th of June, uh, the do's and don'ts regarding implementation of AI. Sabrina? No more? So if you have any feedback, um, feel free to share to also email me directly on Angela at weshape.tech, uh, we sorry. Um, we, we also enjoy if, if you give us some insights on, on maybe what kind of content you're missing out or if you have an idea for an event uh, or something like that. We really love open communication with each other. So feel free, Sabrina. So now um, it's the moment where I actually hand over to um, Søren, who is uh, coming to the really interesting part now. <laughs> so um, let's see. Thank you. Can I share my screen as well? Yeah. Can yeah. you try? I will try and see if it works. So I will say the famous words <laughs> of uh, Corona. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Well, <clears throat> very happy to be here. Thanks for, for reaching out. Um, I, uh, yeah, I wrote this book uh, called Death by Innovation Theater, uh, where, which I'm going to talk about today. What, 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 does, what does that imply? Uh, but first of all, I, um, I wanted to, um, to give you some, some notes about the startup behind the book, because the book is about, like, like Angela said, it's about uh, the endeavors that we had with uh, with my startup earn it uh, and I'll, I'll i'll try to keep uh, this part of the presentation short so we can get to the part about the learnings what did we actually learn from this from this journey uh, but um i will start uh by showing you this so this is the name of the company so the the company is called uh, was called earn it and we were a couple of founders uh, behind that. One of them was, was uh, of course, me. And my name is, my name is Soren Nielsen. Um, I'm here in, in Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, I came from a background before starting up Earned as an editor-in-chief at Denmark's biggest media about private finances. Uh, left that and, and stepped into the wonderful world of, uh, of startups uh, and fintechs, so financial technology. And uh, I became uh, really, really good at doing, doing pitches. And when I did pitches, I always brought uh, this girl right here. I brought my daughter uh, because she called my credit card for the magic card. Uh, she thought that it came with this this endless amount of money and of course why why shouldn't she know uh, know that because that was the way that that i was using um, my, my money as well uh, so so I, that was actually the starting point for the company earn it it was that we want to teach children like my daughter about uh, the value of money uh, so so this was really the starting point the purpose of of the company and and where we ended up was a product that looked a bit like this uh, so it was a, a, an IoT, an Internet of Things a piggy bank, a hardware piggy bank, that was connected to a um, to a to a real time bank account and also to a to an app. So that meant that when when the money came into the uh, into the piggy bank uh, or came into the account, then the piggy bank would uh, light up, and my daughter and all the other kids would have to go and touch the the physical piggy bank to get money into the system. So it was a gamified way of, of having to do with uh, with money, and it was a way of making this digital money tangible because we just saw that that being only digital is an issue uh, for 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 kids to really understand the concept of money. So this was where we, this is where it all started, and uh, and we went actually on on Kickstarter to begin with. Uh, raised around 100,000 uh, euros on on Kickstarter. Um, so that was also, again, the starting point was really also a, a public brand that that was out there. A lot of people that that, that knew it from the from the beginning already. Um, we 
we won a bunch of different awards uh, for for what what we did the the visa everywhere initiative uh, we want for for best innovative customer solution out of a out of out of, out of Denmark uh, we were a part of uh, the think forward initiative which is also where you are you're trying to kind of push the limits onto what is actually possible for the uh, for, for 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 the finances and, and how do we help people understand finances as well and then also being featured in everything from fast company to uh, I was in New York talking to uh, to NBC as well and and CNET and yeah I, I think we, we had a, a huge presence uh, different places and we also did a lot of pilots with uh, with with banks amongst others uh, Barclays that's where the the right hand picture is from as well uh, but it didn't work we didn't go anywhere even though we raised uh, millions of euros we, we did all these pilots we won all these all these awards it ended up with uh, us just kind of let's say waving goodbye uh, last year and saying okay this this we, we couldn't make it scale we couldn't make it work so we 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 decided to pull the plug on the uh, yeah on on the piggy bank and and that actually made me kind of go back and retrospectively think what went wrong what did we do wrong why did why did this not become a success with all the funding that we had all the awards that we had all the recognition that we had and. Um, and that was that was really uh, what I what I where I started out. I, I remember when we when we took the decision on uh, on closing it all down. Uh, I had like two weeks where I was just walking around like a zombie here in Copenhagen and went to different places in uh, in Copenhagen. Just sat down and looked out at at the beach or looked out at at a cemetery uh, and 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 just kind of didn't do anything because if if I wasn't sorn from earn it anymore, what the heck was I then? Uh, and that, that's where it all started with kind of looking at why did this not work? So we fell into this, uh, into this pattern uh, as, I, as I see it. And what we really saw was that we were, we were doing a lot of pitching. We were pitching all the time, different events in front of a lot of different uh, clients, especially the banks who were the, the, uh, the, 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 the customers of the product. We, um, we had the tech boss word, we had IoT, and IoT was really one of the big words at the time. Uh, so so we, we, also, we also, of course, played up against that. We also said things like API and, 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 and big data and, and you name it and gamification and all those different things. But I think IoT was really where it started. Um, we, we really, I, I believe, what well, in retrospectively, we, were, we, we fell in love with, uh, with technology. We fell in love with IoT, we fell in love with the, with the solution before we fell in love with the uh, uh, with 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 the problem, right? So that was also one of the biggest issues that we had. And then, yes, we made pilots. We made so many different pilots with with corporates. Again, coming back to that, we 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 started out as a company that was that was on Kickstarter, selling directly to end consumers. Uh, that didn't didn't work. So, like every good startup, we pivoted. We did something else. But we pivoted towards selling it to the banks instead. So that's where all these pilots, of course, came in that we had to do that with the different banks. And, and at that time, at least, it was really hot to do pilots, which is which is still is, of course, in this environment. Uh, but uh, what really sums it up, I think, is this picture here. Um, this is from uh, the Singapore FinTech Festival. Here I'm standing in front of 5,000 people pitching uh, as one of the words that I mentioned before, we're, I'm pitching the IoT, the, 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 the tech part, and we're doing it as part of a pilot with, with Standard Chartered out of Singapore. So I think this really encapsulates what, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I saw us doing, and what I call it is, it's, it's, it's innovation theater. It's when we, um, when we entertain with new ideas, because that was actually what I was doing. I was, I was going out entertaining uh, different places, with, with innovation, uh, with new ideas. And, and I think there are some clear signs that you can, you can see in this, in this pattern that you can avoid. And, and I think this is, the finger here is not, is, is not at all just pointing at the corporates. I'm just as much pointing at myself and at other startups, because it's just that we have to be aware of if, if cause I'm a big believer in creating new products and making innovation that actually makes a difference in people's lives and not just do entertainment. Uh, but but that also means that we we have to be aware of these signs both on the corporate side and also on the startup side to to avoid them. So today, 
I wanted to uh, to present the three main uh, main learnings that we uh, that, that we had uh, in my time with uh, with Ernest. Uh, and how to avoid these uh, this this type of, of innovation theater. So so the, the book of course has ten different things, but I think these are the three main parts that I saw in the pattern. Um, the first one is be aware of innovation islands, um, and I think that we 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 really uh, saw a lot of innovation islands within the corporates. Uh, one time I remember we went to we went to Finland. Uh, to work with a with a with a bank there, uh, and and then and then we we actually did a, a two day workshop with them first, where we were at, we were at the headquarters, we were meeting all the right people, talking to innovation, talking to the business units, uh, and then we and then we got invited back uh, some weeks later for the next process of of this this. Uh, this collaboration with uh, with the bank, and then suddenly we, we were put into a, 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 an office building that that was not near uh, anywhere anywhere near the, uh, the the headquarters, and we were we were we were in in a place where there were there were bean bags, there were there were these whiteboards, and it was a lot of juniors that were that were a part of of this type of uh, of setup, right? So there was it was juniors, it was people that were just just hired, nobody with uh, with any type of of decision power were there, uh, and 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 none of the business units were there either. So so I think that's just a classical example of what uh, what when when suddenly you're 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 detached from the rest of the company and you're calling it a, 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 an innovation lab or whatever you want to call it but um, for me that's a big big no no and a big sign of that's not where i want i, I, don't, I don't see anything coming out of it because nothing came out of it with uh, with uh, with Ernest and i have a hundred other examples of um, of the same uh, another one is actually where i i took my car here out of copenhagen and i drove all the way to the netherlands for a um, for a a, a, a two day a two day hackathon uh, or or like a, a, with with speed dating, so I I went to great lengths before I went uh, before I went and drove the whole way from Copenhagen to uh, to to Netherlands because it's actually a pretty long drive. Uh, so I, I called and I made sure that the right people were there and I, I thought the right people were there. But then when I when I got there, uh, I sat down. It was again. It, it was it was juniors. It was people that were just getting hired, and we had this this speed dating event uh, where I remember just going uh, we're half an hour with each person, then going to the next person, and then there was uh, one person that didn't show up uh, because he had better things to do. Uh, and I actually just kind of contemplated that I should just make a run for it and just drive home because the, again, that there were there was nothing there. They, they, it was impossible to kind of get that type of buy-in from the right people to also move forward. And I guess. The last example that I want to I want to use here, because I don't have as, as many examples on on some of the other parts, but I think that that this 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 last one is is really what what hit it home for me as well is that I've I've been a part of of several different panels about how to do collaboration between big corporates and and, and startups. And in in one of those panel discussions, I remember that there was there was a, a head of innovation there from a big corporate uh, corporate uh, company. And, and he, he kind of explained how he had built uh, the innovation lab that he was the head of. And he said the first thing that he wanted, he wanted the, it to be detached from the rest of the company. So he wanted it to be somewhere, somewhere else physically. Besides that, he wanted it to, to not have the same type of red tape as the rest of the company. He wanted the processes to be different. So he set it all up uh, in, in, a, in a totally other place. And again, the, the obligatory uh, bean bags and, and whiteboards and, 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 and fun colors were there. But what really hit it home for me was that he said that yes, and the rest of the company, they, 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 they look at us and they call us the innovation clowns, the innovation clowns. And he was, he was saying it like with pride. Uh, in my opinion, again, if you're identifying yourself as an innovation clown, you're going to have a really hard time with uh, ever making any type of impact within that company that you're actually trying to, to innovate things from. Um, the, the second thing I want to mention here is that that you that one of the things that I think that you should be aware of as both a startup and also as a corporate is to really go to great lengths to make a business case always. And I know this is something that kind of splits a lot of people. They say, no, we can't make business cases. Yes, I would say always. Uh, you have to have the intelligent discussion about what type of impact, what type of financial impact is this product going to drive? Or how are we going to measure measure that? I'm not saying that the business case is going to dictate if this is going to be a success or not, or we're going to only measure it on the business case. 
but what we have to have the uh, the intelligent discussion about these types of business cases. Uh, and I remember with with Ernest, we uh, we very much shied away from the business case in the beginning, at least, uh, because we were kind of we were unsure of what the business case was. It was it, it was a nice product. We we thought that we could do a lot of good things for for children, uh, uh, give, give them a better financial literacy, and also, of course, uh, when we're talking to banks, what they're interested in, can we make them into customers or to clients afterwards? But uh, but in in the case of Ernest, that was at least a business case that was too far away it was it was too far away in the future so from that sense it was it was really a business case that we didn't hear and see hit home with with many of the of the banks that we were actually pitching it to and i also remember when when we were in, at the at the end uh, the end year of um, of, of Ernest, uh, we were working together with a big baltic bank and and here we actually ourselves pushed for the business case uh, which I, th I thought was it, it was a it was a great path for us at the moment to, to to take to kind of see could this actually create that type of impact that we said that it could and could it be measured on the side of the of the bank because if you don't do this at least in the financial sector is my experience if you don't make these types of business cases then you will be deprioritized on the other types of innovative uh, things that they can do because the business case oftentimes is is the foundation of how do we measure different types of uh, of innovations up against each other so what we what we learned out of the out of the uh, the baltic bank was that that we we had a really hard time in making a business case that could do anything but uh, but create retention uh, for, for for the bank so i guess i guess i think that that's one of the one of the things that we and we actually had to press the innovation department because the innovation department did not want to do the business case they they just wanted to kind of Put it under the rug and then and then see if it, if it could fly without it. But I, I see a big danger in not going head on with the business case. The the last thing that I want to mention here in the in the presentation is uh, the ever uh, alluding question to pilot or not to pilot. Um, I don't think that pilots necessarily is a, is is a bad thing. I think that pilots uh, can be good in certain uh, certain places at certain times when the product is not ripe yet, when it's not mature yet, when it has not seen the validation from the market yet. I think a pilot is totally in place. But what I what I saw with Ernest was that even though we we had a lot of a lot of users uh, on our on our platform, we were live with several different banks already. Uh, we were still being pushed into pilots each and every time that we talked to the different banks. And, and the pattern that I saw here was that, that, that the banks really used it as, as to, to prolong the whole process of, uh, of are we going to do uh, a, a, a production environment uh, uh, launch or not? Uh, so it was, it was really also, because it was, it was, again, it was the only way, it was the only lever that a lot of the innovation departments had to kind of uh, pull was was the was the pilot, uh, so so here I think it was it was interesting to see that 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 the that the pilots oftentimes ended up with nothing, and and I can I can say that the that that with with a, with a bank like Barclays for instance we we did three pilots, and nothing came out of it three pilots so it was a lot of work and I can I can name drop a lot of other banks we've done pilots with as well Standard Chartered I mentioned before uh, OP out of out of out of out of uh, uh, the Nordics as well so. We've done all these pilots, and I can just see that that one of the one of the uh, things that we did wrong at Ernest was that we said yes to the pilots. I was I was becoming the master in pilots. I knew exactly how to do a pilot. I knew how to put up milestones, what the uh, what the banks wanted out of those pilots, and 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 then uh, and and then it then it stopped because I I didn't know how to go from the innovation department, the innovation theater part, and then going into a, into a production environment and and to to the real business units. And I think one of the things we did wrong was not to talk about uh, what happens if the pilot is successful. How do we measure if the pilot is successful? Uh, what's the price going to be? once we are past the pilot and we're launching into the market because the pricing discussion is something that's being pushed uh, pushed around and nobody really wants to take it uh, especially on on, uh, on on something like this but i would say that 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 having the discussion around the pilot and what the what's going to happen afterwards and what the price is going to be afterwards is some of the things that i would change uh, if I was going to go back and do some things differently with uh, with Ernest, so really the discussion around pricing needs to be a big part of of the whole innovation uh, innovation part. Um, and I guess I can I can end up with uh, with with one last kind of uh, anecdote. 
uh, out of uh, what, what, what we did, at least also connected to, to pilots, we went to South America uh, for a week to, uh, to uh, integrate our solution with, uh, with, with the bank there for a, for a pilot. And I remember us, us uh, coming uh, to, the, uh, to the office where this was all going to happen. And we, we asked for our contact person at the, at the desk, at the reception, and, and nobody knew who, who they were, the, the people that we were engaging with. Nobody knew about the innovation department. Uh, and then when I finally got a hold of, of the people that were actually in charge of the innovation department, they, they took us uh, through the different offices uh, or, or through the office space where people were sitting, um, the, the bank's people were sitting in, in, in nice shirts and blue and it was, it was white, it was, it, was, it, was, it was like a bank is, right? And then at the very, very back, they opened up the doors into this um, beanbag, uh, whiteboards, uh, yellow on, on the walls, uh, kitchen area, uh, and all you can eat snacks. Uh, kind of kind of thing, right? So it was it was again it was a totally different environment that was not connected to the rest of the of, of the bank. And I, in retrospect, that was again a danger sign into actually creating an innovative product that would that would also come to market. Um, and that was actually uh, what I what I had uh, for for the presentation uh, today. Uh, happy to take uh, questions on on your side uh, on. Uh, on, on this or, or other things, of course, as well. So before um, I actually open uh, for the questions uh, for other people, I have a pressing one. So after all the beanbags and everything, do you actually own a beanbag yourself by now or? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, I no, I, I don't. I I I I think I'm kind of I have a phobia for for beanbags suddenly, right? So no, I don't. Okay. Um, so guys, if you have questions, um, if, if you had an experience or something you want to check uh, if Soren has made the same um, experience or not, um, go ahead and either use the chat if you're too shy uh, to talk um, or just ask away. So uh, maybe in the meantime, while people uh, are probably writing something, I was wondering, um, so do you not believe at all now in, in, in innovation hubs and things like that? Um, or um, or would, you, would you be still open enough to say, okay, let me prove that, it's, um, that you can make actually another, a different experience than that? Both, both yes and no. I would say that that uh, with with Subayo, where I'm working now, uh, I, I I use of course my experiences from from before as well, and and we're also selling our solution to uh, to banks. It's a it's a subscription management company that 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 sells the the overview of subscriptions and the cancellation of subscriptions that is then going to be embedded or that is embedded into the the bank's interfaces, right? And and we're live with eight different banks, and I would say that. We get approached by a lot of innovation departments as well, and and I also uh, of course reach out to innovation departments. I don't I don't see them necessarily as as something that is that is that is bad. Uh, I see them as as a way that we can segue from the innovation department into something that is then a business unit within the bank. What I am really uh, careful about is engaging with 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 the innovation departments that that are that are physically a, a different place than the uh, than the, the corporate themselves or if they're process wise a different place than the rest of the uh, of, of the bank or if, if they if they haven't had any experience with with the, with with doing these types of, of partnerships I guess I'm, I'm I'm just also getting a bit tired of being the king, the guinea pig of uh, of how do we trial and error uh, us into something that that can work uh, with the bank so I would say it, it depends I'm I I truly think that there are there are innovation departments out there that are doing a fantastic job that are that are scouting for who can actually do a, a difference in in my company that are that are that are the, uh, the 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 internal champions and actually the the internal people that can navigate for us for for the for if it's a, if if you are a startup that can navigate within that and kind of say okay who are the stakeholders who are we. Uh, who, who, who do we need to get into the room? But but I, I'm I'm very wary of, of innovation departments that which sole focus is is to, to get to a pilot because that that's what they're getting that's what they're being measured on, um, without having any type of connection to the rest of the of the company. 
So Audrey is asking if you can name some key points that uh, would improve the corporate innovation and startup partner uh, partnership process. And to end, um, for example, um, from an approach or relationship starts to com commercialization. Mm -hmm. and, and she's saying thank you for sharing. So <laughs> welcome. Uh, I I think uh, that's that's a really good question. If I had like the the real answer, the, the big answer on that, but I, I would say that I've I've seen some of these things work. Uh, I think that a, a a bank like, for instance, BBVA out of the out of Spain, uh, also big in Latin America, they have what they call the three six nine uh, approach, and I guess it's it's a process. I think you have to have a process in place where the whole company understands, okay, this is the process that we, that we use to get a new, uh, new things into, into the bank. So first of all, I would say that kind of choose a process. I don't have a particular process that's better than others, but I think choose a process for how do we go from uh, scouting to actually launching something in, in the bank. And if you're not able to make that type of journey, you're not ready yet to, to make these, uh, these, these, these partnerships. Because what they do in the 369 approach is that they spend three days First, on, uh, on on finding the let's say the, the the need, the business case, and finding the different stakeholders that are needed uh, as as part of the uh, of the of the of the whole process. And that can be people from the data team, it can be people from development, and then from the business unit. And then they spend um, uh, six weeks, uh, so three six nine. They spend six weeks um, preparing uh, the, uh, the the type of of uh, of pilot uh, and and uh, and production that they want to go to, uh, so they have again six weeks to do that. So they put it into a, into a time box, and then they spend nine months afterwards uh, in doing pilots and and doing and, and then making it ready for for a commercial launch. So I think that's that's one of the things that I would I would mention. So having a process is is just uh, very very important, uh, and and um, I think on the on the side of uh, of, of that as well, we're talking about what we talked about before is that. Have 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 a price tag on uh, both what the pilot is going to cost. If it's going to be for free, then then fine, so be it. But have the discussion around what is, what is going to cost once we launch into the uh, into the market. Uh, and then and then of course it, it's 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 also finding those stakeholders internally that can that can kind of um, champion this. Uh, and that cannot only be uh, within innovation. They need to be champions, different places that have a, a stake in, in, in also these new innovative uh, products. Because if not, then we're going to spend a lot of time on, on, on talking to the wrong people. And I, I think that's one of, the, one of the points I have as well is that we spend way too much time talking to the wrong, uh, to the wrong people. So it's identifying those that can actually do that. Um, but I, don't know, I thought that uh, Marika uh, Carstens also had a, had a, had a question, but I, I don't know if that's... Yep. We also have, I'm um, sorry, I jumped over Stefan, who was too shy to ask. He's saying thanks for the experience. Okay. And he's asking how you would approach a pricing discussion if there are no people with decision power around. And how would you present your expectations in a pilot context to move into the real business unit? Yeah, yeah. And that, that, that's, those are really, really good questions. I would say, first of all, if there's no decision makers present, then I wouldn't even bother. There needs to be decision makers. That's that's the point blank. That's what I mean. Like we've I've been in too many scenarios where there was no no decision makers and there was nobody that could that could engage the decision makers. Then then the company then the culture is not ready to do anything about uh, uh, these types of partnerships. Then then innovation just becomes something that you kind of take off, uh, and then nobody else kind of cares. And then you take take this small body and then don't don't bother the mothership. And actually, I remember when we did a, a, a pilot with with a bank and we did a, a successful pilot. Uh, then, then, the, then, then our, our our main champion, our main our main contact was kind of like, yes, now we have to go into production with uh, with the rest of the bank and go into uh, the commercial agreement. I'll I'll just try to see if I can slip you in without any, without anybody noticing it. You, you yeah, like you you can't disturb the mothership. That those were the words that he was using. Like I mean that. It's gonna it's gonna be hard to do something like that without having decision makers there. But I think the uh, the, the part about um, let's say that there is a decision maker there that it. It's finding the decision maker. It's finding who will benefit from this new innovative process. Who has a budget that they want to lay on the line to do uh, such a thing? That, that that will for me be the first thing that you have to find. Uh, then then secondly, you have to discuss what is what is then the uh, again come back to the business case. What's the success criteria here? Yeah, are, we, are we talking about new client? Do we want new clients? Is that, is that what we're doing? Do we want to engage more with our current clients? Do we want to have customer support costs going down? What's the aim of this? 
what's the what's the main KPI that we're going to have on this? And then we're going to do if we're going to do a pilot, then we're going to have of course that in a let's say a, a small scenario where, where we are where we're going to measure that and see okay is this, did this really do something uh, for this? Uh, and and then uh, then of course before we go into the the pilot, I would have the discussion around what's the pricing going to be. So one is what what, we, what is pilot going to cost us, uh, and what is what are we going to uh, uh, to to pay if we are going to be successful? Uh, and 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 of course I would say that that's a back and forth both on the the the, the, the startup scale up whatever, and and with the uh, with the bank as well, kind of saying what's the price for this going to be? Is it going to be per API call? Is it going to be per a new client is it going to be uh, all customers that are, that are engaging with this or how are we going to measure that and how we're going to be be, uh, be be paid how are we going to buy this as well so i think for me that those are kind of the natural steps in in, in that type of setup so marike he's all yours for your questions uh, you get to ask them now if you want thank you thank you so so um I think I can really relate to a lot of things that you have said, Sören. So thanks really also for, for sharing. I think what is, so you, so you discussed a lot about, okay, if you bring innovation from outside to a company, right? So you say, okay, when you want to partner with them, do you have experience how this can work from inside out? So to really make room for, for innovation inside the company, how can you change a culture into that direction? Yes, I have an experience um, and it's a kind of a, I'm going to say it's kind of a sad experience because it, it, it was actually that uh, we were, we were being used with one in, in one instance, we were being used by, by a bank to create that type of urgency and that type of internal culture. Uh, and that was, that was really, really clear uh, for us retrospectively that, that we've been used, that we were used for that. Uh, and, and then actually they, they ended up uh, making a, a competitive product uh, internally. Uh, so, so, but, but, but I think that, I think actually what, 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 what works here would be that you, uh, that you have somebody externally to also kind of maybe push the internal boundaries. If you of course have the uh, decision power, you have uh, management behind it. I would say that, that that could be a way of kind of pushing the limits onto what type of culture do we want and what type of, um, of, of innovation do we, do we, do we need as well. Um, and then I think the, um, the, the, the playing field should just be the same. By that, I mean that if you come in externally or you come in internally, it will be the same process. So I'm coming back to the point from before, just choose a process and, and don't say that now it, it's gonna be different every time. No, choose a process because that also means that you give the, the, the startup, you give your internal people kind of uh, an overview of what, am I, what, are, what steps do I need to go through before we do X, Y, and C. If, if, if you don't have a process for this, then I, I really don't believe in it. Then, then, it's, then, then, it's, then it's going to be hard to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for sharing. So do you, if, I, if there's another question, I would just add one if that's, if that's fine, Angela. So, so yes, sure, sorry. thank you. So with this whole lean startup approach and Ash Mariah, so do you think that's, that's a working approach? Have you seen that successful anywhere? Yeah, so the, 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 the whole build, measure, learn philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, personally, I'm a big believer in that. I'm, I like the build, measure, learn philosophy. Also, because you build small things and you pilot them, and then you, yeah, you talked about fail fast before as well. It's a big cliche, of course, but I, I would say that at least building things small, uh, and and then kind of seeing if that if that really works or not. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that a lot of corporates have is that okay, suddenly we have to build something that is not perfect from the beginning. Wow, we can't do that, you know, and and. Uh, and I think that the mindset on that is, is, going, is going to be very, very hard. And that's why I think actually that the collaboration with an external partner, seeing how we can actually scale down a big thing into something small, just with mock-ups or uh, some, 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 some people in a room or, or whatever, in kind of de-risking it. I think that's really, uh, that's some of the things that I think that, that where, where, where smaller companies and big companies can, can really learn from each other as well. Because I also think from the startup's point of view, if you're doing something here, you also have to acknowledge that there is a process of red tape and things that needs to be done internally in a, in a bigger company because the risks are just that higher. So I, I don't believe in, the, in, in companies just coming in and, 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 and throwing all that away and just thinking, Let, let's just do something that's totally fun and has no connection to anything. That's my point from before as well. That, that's never gonna work. But I, but I, but I think that there's there's definitely room for for these these types of uh, of innovative things from within uh, uh, the corporates as well. Great, thanks a lot for sharing. So, any more questions? 
So I have a question. Hi, Soren. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, thank you, Marika. It's nice to see you here. Marika was a board member at WeShare Tech as well. So it's okay. very nice to see that she's uh, joining the community still ongoing. So Soren, I have a question. Um, how do you think companies and innovation departments can kind of bridge better, you know, like, um, there seems to be this disconnection between what happens in the innovation department and the rest of the company. Do you have like very like hands-on ideas or from your experience, how could the bridge look like? Yeah, yeah, maybe. I think that I've I've seen too many times. Again, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the financial industry because that's that's what I know. I've seen too many times that the innovation department is kind of an appendix. It's kind of an add-on. And, and that both is physically and, 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 and process wise, but it's very much also the people working within them. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's, it's really, it's younger people or it's people that, that kind of didn't fit anywhere else. And you can just go and do some innovation, right? And that I think this, if, if, if you're not taking innovation seriously from, from, from management, you're not prioritizing, you know, you're not, you're not uh, professionalizing, you're not getting people that actually know what they're doing into those types of positions. Then, then it's going to be uh, going to be hard. I think that's one of the first steps. And then I'm I'm a big believer in, in kind of dumping an innovation department in the middle of a company and not setting it out on the side. Like I I, I really think that they need to be in the middle of everything. They need to see all the dirt. They're going to need to be uh, exposed to all the red tape. And they and hopefully they are then uh, the, the the minds of them is then is then at a place where they can navigate within it. Because I've also seen it very successfully when you when you have somebody internally. That that can that can then do that type of um, of, of of work. Right? So I'm, I'm I'm I think it's it's kind of it's those types of people that have that kind of people long stocking uh, mentality where they think that I've I've never tried that before. I'm, I'm probably pretty good at it. Uh, if so, if they have that type of mindset, I think those are the ones that can kind of also also uh, tear down some of the boundaries. So I think it's about getting the right people to do it. It's about professionalizing it uh, and also measuring it. Uh, the same way the rest of the company is, is measured. I, I, I think that if you're, if you're not measuring your innovation department and the rest of the company is being measured on different KPIs, again, you're not going to be taken seriously. Uh, it's going to be like, yeah, but you're not being measured on anything and uh, you can just play and I, can, I have to work, right? So I think there's, there's, there's a cultural thing here that needs, to be, uh, that needs to be addressed. And with that, I think my last point would be that, that uh, the cultural part of it is, is also around risk. Uh, so that means that if the company is not ready to take a risk, uh, then there's no need for innovation departments because innovation equals risk. Uh, so I think that, that that needs to be there as a, as kind of a, a a foundation for everything. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janine. Um, so um, if you do not have a follow-up question, then Stefan would have another one. Um, so Stefan is asking if there could have been anything at all in um, in the Earnit uh, founding team that could have made a difference, you know, something like different expertise or different communication or decision process, things like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think, of course, the, the book is called Death by Innovation Theater, uh, but it, but of course it's an angled truth. Uh, because of, of course, I'm, I'm not saying that innovation theater was the only reason why we didn't work. Uh, there was there were there were other reasons as well, uh, and I think one of the reasons was actually what what Stefan is, is mentioning here is that that our our founding team was missing uh, a technical background. We were missing a technical founder. Uh, we had we had uh, commercial founders. Uh, we had uh, uh, marketing uh, marketing founders, uh, communication founders. We did not have a, t a technical a technical founder, uh, and I think that 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 was one of the uh, that's one of the biggest issues. And I would I will personally I would never ever go into a a company again without a technical founder. Uh, and that's why I think actually with with Subayu I, I went into the totally other direction. So with Subayu I've gone into a company that has that is uh, let's just be honest it's a bit nerdy. Uh, the two founders uh, both uh, have engineering backgrounds. And so, so, so I was drawn towards somebody that could actually execute on the, all the pitches that I was doing, right? So I think that all the promises that I, that I was making. So I think it's a great point. Like, uh, of, of course, of course, there, there, there are things in the founding team that need to be there. So, so I would say that, I would actually say that the, the, the technical founder part is even more important than the commercial, uh, the commercial founding part, even though those, those two are oftentimes the ones that, 
that you are looking for when you're starting up a, a, a new company? So um, um, I also have a question. Uh, it's me again. Um, so I, I was wondering because I think there might be some companies out there listening to you and thinking, oh, great, that means I can save money. I do not need extra innovation people. Um, would you agree with me that might be wrong? Because I always think that people that are busy with a quite full day-to-day -day job, um, they hardly ever have the time to even do something creative or, you know, not just being the hamster wheel and like keep it rolling, 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 but actually look at what is needed for the future. Mm. Um, so you might still need extra people or you have to actually create the space um, for the people you already have to even enable them to do um, something innovative. Or what, what is your take on that? I think if 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 you if you think you, you don't need to innovate, then you of course you're, you're going to die because it's going to be uh, it's going to be fun and games right now, but then uh, in, in in a moment it's going to be over. And I think if, you, if, if for instance if you if you take uh, the book Innovator's Dilemma, I think it illustrates it very very well uh, with 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 all the data, all the empirical data that's in that they are looking at. They're looking at different industries on what would happen in that, and then the leaders of those different industries. They they were they were they were gone 10, 20 years after uh, because they did not innovate. And the then the issue for them in, in in the empirical data on that was actually that they were making too much money on on the current clients that they had. And and the current clients that they had were not interested in in the new innovative things that they were they were they were doing always. Uh, and 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 that's actually something that we that I think we all we're seeing it's the same type of tendency right now in the financial industry, where we're seeing that. Bigger traditional banks are focusing more on big corporates and on, on uh, private banking and, 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 and clients that are delivering a higher margin. Whereas uh, let's say SMEs, so small, medium-sized businesses, and, and also uh, uh, the younger generation are not being focused on. And, and that's where innovation is going to, going to come from. So if, if you, uh, but, the, but the hard part here is that, that when push comes to shove within a company and, and you have to prioritize your, your resources, you you will always be pushed by the board and by others towards uh, where the margins are going to be going to be the biggest unless you have a conscious decision on that we actually need to do uh, innovative things that we're not going to make a lot of money on today to be prepared for the future so i think if you're not aware of this type of scenario then you're going to you are going to be punished uh, along the way it, it might not be today it might not be tomorrow but along the way you will you will die yeah so if there are no further questions, um, I would like to just let you know that uh, already today, actually, we're going to um, publish a blog post um, with the takeaways. Um, there's going to be five in them. You'll also easily find the link where to uh, order Soren's book if you want um, to have a thorough read and, and actually get all the 10 uh, learnings. Um, one hour lunch and learn is a bit short to get into all of them. That's why um, uh, we kind of had to shorten that. Um, but I can really recommend the book. And um, you will have also the recording. The recording might not be from the first moment that the blog post is on. Um, but uh, keep checking back if you want to re-see uh, something uh, or if you have a friend that completely missed the lunch and learn. Um, so I think that's it from our side. Last chance, very last chance for a question. Three, two, one. And I think it's time to say um, goodbye to Soren and to all our community. Thank you so much for attending this Lunch and Learn. Thank you so much, um, Soren. I cannot uh, emphasize enough um, how grateful we all are that you're sharing and um, so willing to share also. So it was so great having you here and uh, we look to, uh, forward to other touch points in the future. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Bye. -bye,